France, uh, mainly in the area of Toulouse and also uh, startups all over Europe on various projects. And today I will uh, present you what we do at Intel. Uh, so if you have technical questions or use cases, uh, feel free to, to interrupt me uh, because we have like 45 minutes, I think, or 35. So we, ha we have time to, to stop and we can talk later. So uh, we are not really well known for IoT yet, but that's uh, not because we are not doing uh, anything. We are doing quite a lot, in fact. So um, last year we released uh, the tag uh, Android Wear, for example, on a lot of other uh, Android Wear devices that are perhaps less famous than uh, tag. So just to show that uh, the hardware and the software is there, uh, mainly coming from the mobile uh, division of Intel because it's an adaptation of a, a mobile phone, more or less, in a very small package. So that's one way to do IoT, is to uh, miniaturize uh, all the mobile platforms that we have for cell phones or tablets. And uh, we released uh, last year a new uh, family of chip uh, called Curie uh, on a processor called Quark that are designed for very small wearable devices on small industrial devices that run on small batteries, for example. So there is no user interface, no graphics, just a, a very tiny uh, processor. Uh, so here you can see the, um, the Curry uh, being in embedded in a bicycle uh, on with an um, inertial unit uh, to monitor all the tricks that the guy is doing. Uh, so that was last year. On today, if you look at the X Games, there's a lot of uh, guys doing tricks with a uh, crew inside their boards or bikes, so it, it's rather fun. A lot of potential for wearables. And um, the main thing we are trying to do is to make IoT boards and IoT processors really easy to integrate uh, for people. So it's not really the world of old school embedded where it was super difficult and it took years of embedded engineers to do IoT. Uh, for example, this small company from uh, Northern France decided to do uh, a sort of smart audio speaker that is connected to all your other devices with a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, uh, iFile grade audio chip. And they did that uh, very quickly because they are using a module uh, where all the complex parts are in the module, so uh, you can't really change it. And they only have to design the expansion board for this uh, module. So we go big on modules at Intel, but our competitors also uh, try to do that. So that's a very interesting trend in the industry. Uh, you don't have to redesign hardware very often. Most of the projects we follow, in fact, just take hardware from another design, or they take a module and they make the rest of the design themselves. And making an expansion board is something you can do in a few days with a local company where you are, wherever you are in the world, so it's not really difficult. So that's a new uh, step of simplification for IoT right now. And we have, uh, so we've seen the Android on mobile side, we've seen small wearables, and we also have a lot of activity in the smart IoT, uh, drones, uh, self-driving cars, this kind of stuff. Autonomous drones, of course. Uh, so that's a very interesting trend. Uh, so people know us for this kind of stuff, but we also have very, very tiny uh, devices and processors that can be uh, wearables. So that's one of my projects right now uh, for industrial clients. We have a pair of glasses that have a, a very good quality uh, camera. And we do computer vision on the compute module that is plugged with a USB on the glasses. So the glasses are a consumer grade uh, product. You can buy them in supermarkets in the US. Uh, but we plug a compute module and out of the box it comes, it becomes a, um, a very complex uh, computer vision set of glasses where you can develop your own code on Linux and just have fun. And we have mm, more uh, advanced uh, designs, for example, Daiquiri, uh, with um, augmented reality uh, glasses on top. So in detail, uh, just to give you an idea of what we have with Edison, it's a uh, Natrium processor, so that's something that comes from cell phones and tablets, but running at 500 megahertz. So you have like one third, one fourth of the, of the processing power of a cell phone. So it's, it's quite a lot for IoT. That's the high range of the IoT for us. We have smaller stuff. Um, and because it's a very standard uh, Linux uh, board, 
you can do a lot of stuff with it. And in terms of operating system, we work a lot with uh, Yocto. So embedded professionals usually uh, like that quite a lot because you can go to production. So a very, I mean, we, we had quite a lot of cool IoT boards on the market from Intel or from competitors in the last years. Uh, you have Raspberry Pi, Arduino, a lot of cool stuff uh, that are great for prototyping. But we've seen that people were not able to switch easily from prototyping to production with this kind of board because uh, they have to redesign the hardware and it costs a fortune, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, or certifications are not compatible with industrial projects or support is not there. So right now what people ask, both in startups and in industrial clients, is to have a hardware that is super easy for prototyping, really flexible, like a maker or stuff, that is no-brainer, but with all the features on certification and support to go to production with the exact same hardware. Uh, so that's what we are doing on trying to do even more uh, for the future. For example, Edison was released as a maker product, but people, because people were using it in production, we added the industrial support and long-term support that people expect. So we, we are shifting from a, a pure maker mode to a maker plus uh, industrial. But you don't have to choose. That's a good thing. Uh, for example, this design is quite interesting. On Edison, you have one general purpose Linux with Atom. So that's for uh, computer vision or uh, hosting uh, a Java stack or doing advanced stuff. But we also have a tiny processor with a real-time operating system. So having the two kind of uh, OS uh, is really interesting. You can do different stuff with it. Uh, plus, we have all the IO you expect <coughs> from an IoT board. Um, on so we've seen a, a Linux board. This is totally different. This is a, it looks like a microcontroller, but in fact it's a very tiny uh, processor with a real-time operating system on top of it. Uh, and we've been uh, very happy to have this uh, processor taken as reference for the Arduino or Genuino 101 board. It has different names depending on countries. In Europe, it's Genuino. And uh, the cool thing is that previously on uh, older uh, Arduino boards, you had the microcontroller. So it was a very cheap and very uh, simple and sturdy piece of hardware. And now to replace that, uh, you have a small 32-bit processor with a real-time operating system. Uh, there is a hardware NOAA network available uh, on the chip and uh, Bluetooth Low Energy plus all the IOs you, you expect from a, an Arduino board. So in fact, that's an, uh, a product that is uh, representing a very interesting trend in the industry. We are going so low in terms of power uh, demands with 32-bit processors at Intel that we are able to replace microcontrollers by processor with real-time operating system. So that's a lot more computing work, of course, to emulate the real-time nature of a microcontroller. But when you do that, with a, a processor, you can run a lot more code. Uh, you can have uh, IPv6 uh, over Bluetooth, over a lot of things. You can deal with a lot of radios, modems, internet. Um, so that's really fun. Um, so that's a, a big trend in the industry right now. We try to put a smarter processor in the lowest form possible. Uh, so right now you can uh, work with a, a small battery and we have smaller processors without Bluetooth that can last for a very long time with a, a coin battery. So that's where we are uh, going right now. Uh, in terms of development, it's also fun because this board by default is working with Arduino ID like you would expect from any Arduino board. But you can plug a GTEG uh, cable and flash it with an open source software that is called Zephyr. And you have a, a really advanced professional development board uh, during the day. And when you go back at home and you want to play with your kids and show Arduino, you just use Arduino ID. So the same hardware can be used with very different software depending on uh, what you are targeting. That's kind of fun. Uh, people want to have it all. They want to have something simple and something super strong and with a lot of features for professional usage models. So we, we are trying to, to target that. For example, the, the NOAA network is kind of a, 
a super advanced feature that uh, people don't really ask uh, by default on an Arduino board, but because we can, we just put it, and people find very interesting things to do with it, so that's really fun. So um, in terms of hardware trends, we notice that uh, small processors with real-time operating systems are replacing uh, microcontrollers as much as possible. Not everywhere, but with time it will. Um, on when I say real-time operating system, it's not a Linux with patches. It's a professional-grade operating system that has been open source by, for example, Intel on the Wind River. Uh, but you have competitors, of course, that, that do that. Uh, so you have access to a new generation of real-time operating system that is really strong, that is designed to be deployed, uh, remotely upgraded, uh, a lot of things that you need for large-scale deployment. So we are not playing anymore. We are really, uh, uh, we have all the software tools we need to, to go on large-scale IoT deployment. So that's really fun. And the second trend is that we try to add a lot of uh, coprocessors in a way uh, to 32-bit processor because it's nice to have generic programming in C, C++ on 32-bit real-time operating system. But usually people ask us for FPGA, for neural network, for uh, graphics, to not to display something, but to offload some computation on the graphics core. So that's what we are doing right now. Uh, Curry was an interesting trend. We had uh, a neural network. Uh, because Altera is now part of Intel, we try to merge uh, FPGAs with 32-bit processor more and more. The problem we have is that we don't really know what is uh, popular in terms of size of FPGA, in terms of feature, in terms of integration with processor. So if you have a specific request and you tell us, okay, if in two years or five years you can have this kind of processor with this kind of FPGA, I could use it for this kind of usage model. And we, we try to gather all the inputs and uh, give back um, a feedback to the um, guys that are designing the chips uh, to, to influence the, the future designs. Uh, because plugging FPGA on Intel, we, we can absolutely do it. And we already do it for network equipment, for example. But for IoT devices, picking the right uh, mix is not always easy. So your input is welcome. So the trend is that hardware is becoming a lot more complex. We are switching from a microcontroller to uh, processors with FPGA on our networks. But at the same time, software is getting a lot easier to use. I'm a, a biologist by training, um, I'm not a, a software engineer. I just start, learn to, to develop software because I had to. So I like software to be as simple as possible. On if I don't even see hardware, that's even better. So I'm really lazy as a developer. Uh, that's why I'm dealing with clients, because they are lazy too. So we are both lazy, and we, we try to do things as quickly as possible. So that's how we should work. And the, the thing is that because software is getting uh, a lot easier to use, uh, in fact, all these hardware advanced features are, are not a problem at all. You don't need to be a super hardcore embedded engineer to, to use them. If you are, you can go further for sure, but uh, you can do a lot of stuff by just using open source uh, standard technologies um, that were previously not really available. So that's really a, a nice touch. It's a totally new trend, new kind of doing IoT, uh, but it's fun. In terms of connectivity, we see um, a lot of things happening, and that's in fact where I have the most uh, problems with clients. Uh, of course, by default, because we are Intel, we try to put Wi-Fi everywhere where it fits, uh, because it's, it's kind of a standard, and it's easy to use, and it's fully networked enabled. It's very simple. As a developer, network is, uh, is easy to use. Uh, but in fact, uh, because Wi-Fi is not really uh, good everywhere, on Bluetooth is sometimes too uh, uh, consuming too much power. We have to switch to other uh, radio frequencies on protocols. Um, and also because we have to interact with a lot of legacy systems that have their own um, uh, frequencies. So right now we work a lot with uh, ISM frequencies for uh, consumer products. For example, from home automation, we have uh, Z-Wave, 
very standard 433 uh, uh, frequencies. Uh, but more interestingly, for uh, professional clients, we have uh, 15.4 frequencies where we use a lot of uh, ISA 100.11 and uh, sometimes wireless heart. And the thing is, as a developer, you don't want to really deal with that. Uh, you don't have to use a specific SDK. In fact, there is a lot of standards right now to emulate an IPv6 network on top of everything, pretty much. Uh, if you pick the right hardware with the right drivers, uh, so you don't have to, to see the details. So it's called uh, six lopan. That's a very standard uh, uh, name for that. Um, but you also have the thread group that is heavily sponsored by uh, and backed by Google that is proposing something more or less on top of that. But the point is, if you want something that is simple from a software point of view, it's possible. You just have to pick the right technologies that are uh, compatible with six lopan or something similar and uh, pick the right hardware with the right drivers so that you won't have to see that at all. So it's possible, you just have to, it has to be in your specifications when you design your, your product. And the good thing is that you can add a lot of intelligence on top of legacy systems without breaking anything, uh, just by interacting with a CAN bus, with a uh, ISA protocol, so there is a lot of stuff that are already there. Uh, for example, I like to buy the cheapest and the numbest home automation products uh, from Lidl or a store like that, and to plug them with a very complex board like a, a Linux board like a Edison, and uh, um, transform completely the, the usage model of the technology to make it uh, really smart. And uh, people in big factories really want that right now. They want to integrate with all the legacy systems and had a, a layer of interoperability that would be totally open and under their control uh, to, to manage everything. So in a way, as a supplier, you would still be able to propose a black box with your proprietary technology in it, as long as you propose an interface that works over radio or network or whatever uh, with the uh, core uh, backend of uh, the company. So it's not just connecting your IoT devices to a Windows PC and asking the Windows PC to do an emulation over the network. They don't want that anymore. They don't want uh, a PC with a Windows open system or whatever uh, to control every piece of robot in the factory. They want to have interoperability at the IoT uh, device uh, side of the solution and to uh, remove all the proprietary technologies uh, in the middle. Um, in the middle, so you still have your proprietary stuff on the edge if you want, uh, to have strong interoperability, uh, solutions that are easier to integrate with each other, more flexible, and at the end of the day, it's uh, cheaper. Um, and of course, because we are in Toulouse, uh, we can talk about long-range messaging, like uh, Sigfox and uh, LoRa. Uh, so for us, it's really easy because we can integrate their uh, simple emitter on our uh, hardware. It's a very plug-and-play. Uh, so depending on your country, on the business model you want, you can go with Sigfox, LoRa, or, or something uh, different. And uh, we have a full range of modems uh, that are rather fun also. So the, the core message here is uh, you can have a lot of fun with all the radio technologies, but at the end of the day, as software developers, it's better to just ask for something that uh, you won't have to, to manage at all uh, at high level. And the thing is, uh, today we have a lot of designs that are already on the market. Uh, it's true for Intel, but it's also true for competitors. So that's really a strong message that I would like to, to emphasize because we often see people that come at us and they say, oh, we want to pick your processor and to buy it for $20 and to make a board and to go in China and to make the case and everything. And we tell them, yeah, you could, but you will spend like one year just to do hardware. So uh, you don't really need that. You can pick any gateway that is uh, on the market, like this one that is already there. If you want to put your branding on it, it's probably possible to negotiate a deal with the owner of the design. It's usually possible to find one. There is hundreds on the market. And uh, you don't have to, to redesign your, your hardware. And when they want something really specific, and they say, yeah, but I want to put FPGA, or I want to make a drone, 
uh, we show them, yeah, you want to, to make, for example, a drone, but first we have boards for drones specifically from various sources at Intel, outside Intel with Intel processors. And also you have a design that you can use in a different usage model. For example, this one is uh, what you have in automotive. Uh, designed specifically for automotive because they have very specific requirements. So they want uh, Ethernet, they want very specific things. That the kind of hardware you have in the ceiling of cars, uh, it acts as a modem for, uh, for the Internet, as a gateway in the car, as hotspot, also interacts uh, with the motor, with uh, remote maintenance, with a lot of stuff. So this kind of hardware is just wonderful. It's designed specifically for cars, but uh, the hardware uh, can be used in drone or anything where the, it fits the requirements. So the message is usually we try to find uh, of all the designs that are in the world, the design that is uh, closest to their requirements uh, so that they don't have to develop hardware because it's really painful. So in the past, an IoT project that was Okay, we have to develop hardware and we have to develop software. And today, more and more, we try to just remove the hardware from the equation and to uh, forward them to an existing design. And they only have to focus on software. So integration, in fact, on repackaging on the business model is definitely uh, uh, more interesting and you can go faster to production. And you don't have to, to have the risk of making your own hardware because it's getting more and more difficult. People expect hardware that is really reliable, that is certified with tons of uh, certifications. So designing your own is like totally uh, boring and dangerous. So software, uh, that's where it gets interesting for developers. Uh, we have an explosion of uh, IoT operating systems. Some are open source, some are uh, closed source, so it really depends wha what you want. Um, by default, we work with Yocto, that is uh, an industrial grade uh, operating system for embedded on IoT. But it's rather arid, there is not a lot of features. You have to add your repository yourself. So it's good when you really want to go to production or you want to make something really strong. But for prototyping, it's a bit boring uh, uh, and frustrating. So we have Ostro that is being released this year that is uh, adding a lot more features. For example, remote upgrade, this kind of stuff. And Zephyr is also uh, another trend. It's a real-time operating system. It's not Linux and uh, used for smaller things. So we went as um, low as possible uh, with uh, Linux, but at some point, we are designing processors on even more in the future, processors that are so little, uh, so small that uh, Linux, even with by removing everything, it just won't fit. So we have to go smaller. And the uh, real time is not always necessary, but it's often welcome. So we went with a very tiny operating system that can be customized with different kernels to go very, very low. Uh, not only on Intel platform, it's open source, so it's supporting the competition, of course. Uh, so you can go a lot lower than Linux and usually have more or less the same functionalities. So you have to define what you want, but if you want 6 Lopan or if you want Bluetooth or something like that, it's uh, probably possible. And of course, we still have uh, WinRiver, so it's part of Intel. Or if you want to go with the Google uh, uh, world, you, you have Brio that is uh, being released right now. If you need access to Brio, you can ask me. Uh, we have contacts. But uh, the good point is that you have the choice between operating systems from the open source and commercial world. And the nice thing is that you can switch from one to another. For example, Zephyr is fully open source. But if you want the commercial version of Zephyr, something that looks a lot like Zephyr from Moonriver, you can get it. So in your project, you can alternate between commercial and open source, depending on your requirements. Uh, you don't really have to choose. Uh, you can pick one or the other with different clients, but as a software developer, it's the same thing. So that's a rather cool trend. Uh, you are not blocked in any way. Um, and in terms of development method, uh, you have a, a wide range of uh, choices. Uh, you can go with Arduino IDE, and it's not a joke. I mean, we have a lot of professional clients that 
because Arduino ID is uh, strong enough for their prototyping needs, they just start with that. I mean, why waste time installing a full uh, development environment when you can uh, do something very simple? So you can use Arduino ID or you can use an Eclipse plugin for Arduino. No problem. Um, if you want to use a, a full uh, language like a Node.js, that is JavaScript, for example, if you are more a maker or web developer, that's the kind of language you will like. Uh, there is tons of libraries for, uh, to do advanced IoT uh, development um, with Node.js. So that's really a strong language for prototyping. Perhaps not great for production because uh, all the syntax or everything related to JavaScript is like a nightmare. But in terms of prototyping, it's, uh, it's wonderful. So you have Intel XDK. Uh, it's a free uh, development uh, environment for, for IoT using Node.js. Then if you want to go closer to production, uh, you can use Eclipse. Uh, we have a, a version of Eclipse with C, C++, Python uh, for uh, Edison on all our boards. So that's a way to maintain uh, an Eclipse framework but have uh, IoT uh, linked over the network and everything is managed automatically. So it's still open source. If you want to go commercial, you have the full WinRiver suite of tools. And uh, there's also collaboration tools. So it's not just a development environment, it's a full development solution for teams on top of development tools. And my favorite is that usually I just uh, go directly on the board uh, with a terminal and I have a full access to everything. Uh, whether it's Linux or real-time operating system, it's very flexible. Uh, it's not really difficult. You can install the language, the package you want. Uh, so it's kind of easy to develop uh, complex IoT solutions right now. And it's still possible to do bare metal programming if you are an embedded specialist and you want to totally get rid of the operating system. But honestly, because we usually we propose processors that are rather powerful and have networking capabilities on Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever, when you go bare metal, you just remove all this kind of functionality. So it's not really something you most people would want to do on Intel processors, but technically it's possible. Um, so the message here is that uh, we have a continuity of development methods between uh, hobbyist makers and professionals and we try to maintain software and hardware that allows people to go back and forth very quickly um, because when, even when big industrial clients try to innovate, uh, they want to keep it simple. Uh, so that's uh, how we, we work and that's what they want. So in terms of uh, ecosystem, we try to interact with all the um, uh, cool uh, places in, uh, in Europe and the world. So here locally near Toulouse, we have the Connected Camp at the IoT Valley. Um, we had a TV show about IoT development on the US uh, TV uh, called American Greatest Maker. So I don't know if you can get it online or get it on BitTorrent or whatever, but it was rather fun uh, to show that uh, embedded development can be the uh, subject of a, a TV show and an entertaining one, hopefully. Uh, plus we have uh, a lot of contests um, to try to put in touch uh, IoT developers, startups, with client and distribution channels. For example, uh, this year we had the FNAC Intel contest so FNAC, a big retailer in, uh, in Western Europe, was trying to uh, detect the most innovative IoT uh, designs and try to um, help them go to market in their store. So that's definitely something uh, to think about when you are uh, developing an IoT solution because we see a lot of uh, people with technical skills. Uh, usually they don't really want to team with people with business skills, so unfortunately they do stuff that is not really relevant on the market. And even when they do, they all want to produce uh, consumer products and to sell them on Kickstarter. So why not, but consumer is the most difficult market you can imagine, and uh, Kickstarter is a bit of a jungle, so for one successful company you have a lot of uh, failures. And uh, even when you have money from Kickstarter, it's pre-orders, it's not investment. So you can't really spend time producing your V2. So in a way, uh, we try to tell them, okay, you can do that, but 
have you thought about uh, business uh, models um, for uh, B2B applications? Or would you like to work with a uh, channel distributor that uh, can invest, help you uh, uh, promote your product? We try to, to help as much as possible. Uh, a few uh, startups that we are helping right now. Uh, I'm not really talking about industrial accounts because it's confidential. So we have a professional grade 3D printer that is worth like six, eight thousand euros. So it's really a, a big machine doing uh, full production. It's not for prototyping. You can actually make glasses that uh, are, have the full uh, specification of uh, production glasses. We have autonomous drones with FlyLab uh, on computer glasses with a pivot head. So a lot of smart objects. And uh, I haven't included, but we have, for example, um, collars for dogs to detect their activity on when they are doing tricks. Um, so a lot of designs we are doing with um, a QE, the small uh, processor with a Bluetooth on the uh, neural network. Questions? Remarks. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, and, uh, yes? Regarding Perillo and Edison, yeah. into Edison. Do you know if there is a, a, like a preview image? Of Perillo? Yes, so the good thing is that Edison is uh, the default development platform for Brio at Google. So it's not that it's been ported to Edison, it's, work on, it's working on Edison by default. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you have a build. Uh, you can register on the um, um, Google website. Yeah. Uh, a trick, yeah, and a trick is to use a, a commercial email, not your Gmail account, because they want professionals first. And uh, you can also describe your project, and if you want to run on Intel platforms, uh, because Brio can run on non-Intel platforms too, uh, we can uh, talk with the Google team and give you access uh, if you haven't received your access. I mean, we can propose that they give you access. So if you want, you can uh, send me an email by describing your project and I will forward to the colleagues. But it's running well, yes. Question? Okay, so thanks a lot, and uh, I'm at your disposal, and uh, I will